Hello and welcome to our Gem Pursuit. My name is Matthew Weldon and I'm joined in our magical and mysterious pursuit through the world of antique and vintage jewellery by my trusty co-host, Elise Ketcher. Hello, Elise. Hi, Matthew. And hi, everyone. This week, we're taking you to the big screen and looking at the glitz and glam of Hollywood. Jewellery has played a big role in some of our favourite movies and has been integral to telling the stories that capture our imagination. We'll be taking you some of the classics and their iconic pieces that influence culture both on and off the screen. From standout brooches to glistening ruby slippers, let's get on with the show. Elise, I'd like to start by just talking about the importance that jewellery has had on the big screen over the years. It's in Many famous films, look, we can all think of, uh, and we're, we're going to talk about two famous films each uh, and the jewellery within those and kind of the importance of those pieces. But what is it with jewellery in films and why is it so important? I think it's the reason why we have so many jewellery enthusiasts in the world. And, you know, it's, it's basically because of the story that jewels are able to help tell they're connected to some of the most important moments in people's lives, whether they're happy moments, sad moments, you know, heirloom pieces of jewelry get passed down through families, but they get passed down through death. So that also tells a life story of someone. Sometimes jewels are stolen and then you have the story in your family of, of the, the long lost jewel that was stolen in the family and it's never quite forgotten or you have the jewelry that was gifted to you by your parents on your wedding day or on your 21st birthday, or your dad gave you a watch or your grandfather gave you his ring. You know, all of these things connect us in such a, in such a tangible way. Um, and then they live through onto the next generation. And it's, it's these stories that really have inspired so many films um, to be created, but also people resonate with them because it lives through their own lives. Yeah. I think a lot of people have something like that in their life too. Like they've inherited something, are they? So you can identify with that. And it's kind of, um, with antique jewelry in particular, it's obviously been owned by lots of different people and it's still exactly the way it was. And even at the end of the film, film, we, we can debate which way is the correct way in a second. Oh it's, my. But um, the one thing that's left exactly as it is at the end of the film is always the jewellery. It's almost like it transcended through the film the whole way. And you see, oh, they had it and then the next person had it. But it never changes. And that's exactly why I like antique jewellery that we have because it's still exactly the same way. And although the times have changed and the, the stories have come and gone, the jewelry has never actually changed. So I think it's like the, the permanence of it, uh, which is quite interesting. And obviously there's lots of different films and we can only touch on a few today, but there is, I mean, there's, there's so many, right? But we are going to talk about two stories each of famous films and uh, we'll talk about the key jewellery in it, the story it has, and where it is today. So first one up, Elise, what is your first film and the jewel in it that you think is super important? Well, I wanted to start off with a an, a very old school Hollywood film or movie. There you go. You can say movie, Matthew. And then that way everybody movie. can understand what you're saying. So... If we if we look at old screen cinema, we have a lot of a lot of black and white films. So a lot of um, a lot of what was originally out there is black and white. And I actually remember. I know I'm not I'm not that old, but I actually remember it, at my grandmother's house there was a black and white TV, and I found black and white TV to be to be quite romantic as a child because we had color TV at home, but my grandmother had black and white TV and she preferred black and white TV up until a point. And I remember one particular movie called Casablanca, which was 
as a child, so boring, like absolutely to me as a, as a kid, I was like, well, could we please put on the wizard of Oz? Could we please watch bed knobs and broomsticks, seven brides for seven brothers, anything else, but Casablanca. It's quite a long film, isn't it? It's It's so long. It's so long. Um, and I don't think you really appreciate it until you're older. But the one thing that I really appreciated about Casablanca as a child was actually the fashion. So the fashion that we see, um, especially worn by both men and women, is so dapper. I mean, it's not something that you would see on the streets today, but it was normal for the time period that it's set in. And one thing that was super present in this film is jewelry. One piece of jewelry in particular that my grandmother also used to wear was brooches. Now hers weren't as elaborate as they were in Casablanca, but Ingrid Bergman, Bergman, who is um, the actress in this particular film, she wears one really important brooch. And this brooch to me is just, even in black and white, it captivates, which just goes to show you how amazing this particular piece of jewelry is. Now it's, Create, it was created circa 1938. So we're looking at an art deco right. piece and it's the way that it actually is created is with diamonds and sapphires. The center of it is like a kind of voluminous a knot with one part of the knot being pave sapphire and then the bottom of the knot being um, pave diamonds. So pave means inset stones and they they almost like look like beans, right? But they're quite large. Then on either side of them, we've got one spray on one side, which is like fans of uh, Calibre cut sapphires on one side. And then on the other side, fanning across the other side, kind of like wings spanning out is rows of diamonds, in a fan as well. And then from the bottom, we have articulated uh, drops, which have, I think it's like six or seven drops that end in a briolette cut sapphire. And then it has sapphire, calibre cut sapphires going all the way up. So as you move, these kind of move with the body as well. And she wears this on contrasting white suits or white dresses and you see it throughout the movie it is the only thing about this movie as a child that I remember and I used to ask I used to look at this particular piece and I used to um, go outside and stick flowers on my dress in the buttonholes of my dress to think you know I've got a brooch like the one that's in Casablanca but This just goes to show this is like, I think, where our obsessions with fashion and shoes and jewelry start is when you actually see them um, in situ on film. And it's really, this is why it's really important when we actually display jewels in the shop. A lot of the time people come in and they're like, they see a brooch in a box and they're like, oh yeah, it looks beautiful. But when you see it in situ, when you see it moving around where it's supposed to be, these designers, especially in the Art Deco period, they created the piece so that the piece would, number one, fit into the materials of the period of the time. So when silk was favoured, you'd see the, the fastening of brooches changed to not rip the dresses or they were lighter so that they would fit onto the materials. Um, You also see articulation and the way that the body moves, also the jewellery piece would move. And so this is where it becomes so extremely important to see it on the body or on the dress. Um, And this is why this particular film and this particular brooch for me is definitely one of the standout pieces in film. And 
iconic film as well, of course. Um, it's actually only an hour and 42 minutes long, though. So it's actually it as long like as we five thought. five hours. Yeah. Well, when you were young, like this was, you know, when you're in your, uh, your yeah. earlier stage of your youth, right? You're still in your youth. But, and I, you know, I think about the f- films, actually, the pieces also have to be kind of big for you to see them. So, you know, obviously you can zoom in, right, or whatever, but this is quite a voluminous piece and you gave a really beautiful description of it there and it is definitely one to look up and we'll put a link to it in the links to our, in, in our podcast notes because it's really impressive. Pure Art Deco, like really typical Art Deco. Made by Fla- Paul Flato, I believe. Yes. Um, Wow. Yeah, that's a nice one. One wouldn't mind having that one in the shop at some stage. Well, thank you, Elise. That's going to be a hard one to follow, I think. However, I shall do my best. So the first one I want to talk about is a film that we'll all have known and probably most of us would have seen and has a very famous jewel in it. Well, they're, they're an iconic piece, but they were sold subsequent to the film and then they were later recreated by a very famous jeweler as well. So in the film, they weren't actually made of ruby. Uh, and of course, I am talking about the ruby slippers in The Wizard of Oz. They were actually made of sequins. However, they're later made by Harry Winston in ruby, which we'll get to that in a second. Now, the interesting thing about this in the book, The Wizard of Oz, which is circa 1900 they were actually silver and the reason that they were ruby is that the obviously they're on a yellow brick road and they figured that in this in the film that you wouldn't be able to see silver on yellow as clearly as you would red on yellow and therefore they changed them from silver slippers into ruby slippers Now, of course, they symbolize the journey and the transformation of Dorothy as she wears them to the Emerald City. Uh, And of course, this role was played by Julie Garland and it was really her breakout role. And she was only 16 in this film, which is pretty incredible. But I think this is where every single woman's obsession with shoes begins. These films, and especially the ones we watch when you're young, they're so influential. Now... You can, if you're lucky enough, you might actually be able to get your hands on a pair of these uh, ruby slippers. The original ones from The Wizard of Oz, well, first of all, you can go see them. They're on display in the Smithsonian National Museum uh, of American History. Now, there was a couple of pairs made so that you can view them in the museum, but a pair was found in the basement of MGM's wardrobe department, and that sold at auction for 15000 to an anonymous buyer. They're the ones that are actually donated to the Smithsonian 97.9. But four other pairs are known to exist. One was sold in 2000 at auction. You know how much they got? No, how much? Slight, slightly ominous number, but it was $666,000. Of course, these were, for the film, their sequins. But in 1989, Harry Winston, Harry Winston's son, Ronald Wilson, wanted to pay tribute to the 50th anniversary of this film by creating a real pair of ruby slippers. Over 4,600 gemstones were used, which are 1,350 carats of rubies, 50 carats of diamonds, valued at about $3 million, making them some of the most expensive slippers ever created, I would imagine. So I know the original pair were sequins, but I think these ones are a little bit more opulent and expensive and definitely a serious piece of jewellery inspired from this film. So that's Ruby Slippers and, of course, a beautiful brooch from Casablanca. What is the next film that has a very important piece of jewellery? So we've only got four. This is really hard. But... For my last piece of jewellery, I thought I would do something that was a little bit closer to home. And when I say that, I say that because I worked with the designer who um, designed this piece of of jewellery. So before I became an antique jewellery, jewellery specialist, I did work in modern jewellery as well. And I worked for a designer known uh, as Stefano Canturi in Australia. So I worked in his Brisbane Queen Street store. And 
he designed some really, well, he still designs some really amazing pieces. A lot of them are inspired by the Art Deco movement, the Rococo styles, and of course, the French jewelry from the 1800s. And one piece in particular, although many of you may not know his name, you will know this particular movie and most likely be obsessed with the piece of jewelry that he created for it. The movie is Moulin Rouge, which stars Ewan McGregor and Nicole Kidman as the star-crossed lovers. And the main character played by Nicole Kidman, whose name in the movie is called Satine, is gifted a necklace by a, another potential client slash suitor who has all of the money in the world to be able to shower her with gifts and jewels. And the one particular necklace that she's given reaches all the way to the top of her neck and goes all the way down her decolletage. And it is covered in diamonds. And this particular piece of jewelry is now known as the Satine necklace, um, named after Nicole Kidman's character in the movie. It sits in a private collection, so it's not available to, to be viewed anywhere currently. It's valued at around $1 million. And this particular necklace it did sit in the Guinness World Record books. I don't know if, if that has now been overtaken, but it did sit in the Guinness World Record books for being the most expensive piece of jewelry ever created for a film. I think it's interesting that it's created specifically for that film and it's actually real jewels. Like a lot of jewellery in the films that we looked at, you know, weren't actually real jewellery and then they were recreated subsequently because people liked it. But this is like even on set logistically, that's difficult because you have to look after it. Yes. So specifically in this particular case, we, this necklace was not only just created for the film, it was actually created to contour to the body shape of Nicole Kidman. So it was a couture piece as well, which means that it was fitted exactly to her um, structure. So in total, there was 1,308 diamonds that were used to create this particular piece. And there was one very large Sri Lankan blue sapphire that was placed on the clasp of this particular item. Now it is in the Rococo style. So it's like um, the late 1800s French that this particular piece was supposed to be emulating. However, when you look closely at it, it does have emerald cut diamonds in it and, and modern cut stones in it. So it doesn't have, it has an antique look, mm. but it doesn't have an antique finish. So it's a really nice kind of meshing of the two worlds, especially as this particular necklace really is a star of the scenes that it's in and shows the opulent life that was offered to Satine by this particular baron that was trying to woo her. Um, although love wins in the end. Lovely. <laughs> Lovely. And one thing that I want to say is like the regular fittings that Nicole Kidman had to have. So through the creation of the piece, it said that it took like three months of fittings to actually get the necklace to fit to her body correctly so that it would go down her decolletage and that it would actually flow around her body properly and also fit her very long swan like neck. So, you know, it's a really incredible piece of jewelry, notwithstanding I'm, if you have seen the, the movie, you would have seen that it actually does get ripped off of her as well. Now, because the piece of jewelry was so valuable and so expensive. Well, I'm guessing they didn't rip off that necklace. 
they had a replica made for that scene as well that was crystals and silver so that actually does it did go on tour with all of the costuming and things like that from Moulin Rouge, the um, the one that got ripped off the neck, but not the original, not the actual one that's in most of the scenes. So f- with this particular one, I wanted to share this particular piece because I've, I've worked with the designer Stefano and especially the other pieces that I've seen him design and the thought process that actually goes through, uh, that he goes through to actually create these pieces. He did a lot of research specifically on antique jewelry in France from the 1800s and then started to sketch. So he's very unusual designer because most of the time what you have um, is you have a de- you have a jewelry designer and then you have jewelry workshops who bring the jewelry designs to life. Stefano Canturi is different because he is a designer and he is a workbench jeweler. So he does both. He actually designs the items and then can bring the item to life himself, which is very, very rare in the jewelry world. And importantly, in this particular, in this particular piece, you can see how it all came to life because he was able to contour it to Nicole Kidman's body, but he was also able to bring to life something from the old world that really has now been lost. Just sounds like an amazing necklace to see up close obviously on the screen it looks very good and obviously iconic film lots of people are gonna know it and there's other nice pieces of jewelry in it as well which really stand out but that i think is a star well i don't think we could talk about the importance of jewelry in cinema without mentioning this film It's an iconic film. You know, the funny thing about this, although everyone's going to know this film and there's a very famous piece of jewellery that it centres around, the main actor in this film didn't actually wear the jewel at all. Although it is in in the film. And it is Breakfast at Tiffany's. Moon River. Beautiful voice. You really do. I'd try to sing that, but no one would recognise it. So, But... Obviously, starring Audrey Hepburn uh, and Holly Golightly, like they're socialites in New York. Um, and the kind of the scene that we all know is Audrey Hepburn looking in the, you know, longingly in the window at Tiffany's, right? So we've all been there. I've done that. Everybody goes there and they eat a croissant at the front of Tiffany's. Yeah, he's I've, looking out the window because he has not done it. I, I've been at <laughs> Tiffany's. I haven't eaten a croissant on it, but um, she's wearing a Givenchy dress, pearl necklace, famous scene, right? Sunglasses, um, hair up in a French twist. And the interesting thing about that film is that Hepburn doesn't wear any Tiffany jewellery in the film at all. She aspires. It shows you. It's all about like, it's all about what you aspire to have that's what it is it's about the things that you desire and that's what the whole film is about yes and uh, well she does have the tiffany blue satin eye mask that she sleeps in right so um getting there small steps at a time um but of course the tiffany yellow diamond is in that film and this is such a famous piece of jewelry because there's only been some very few people who've worn it. And its iconic status really started then. I mean, just to give you a bit of information about the diamond, it's 128 carats. It's obviously yellow, Tiffany yellow diamond. In terms of scale, this is an absolutely enormous diamond. Think about probably like the size of your thumb, possibly something like that. A male thumb. Yes, This time, before it was cut, was 287 carats. Tiffany sent their chief gemologist, George Frederick Coons, who, of course, the gemstone Coonsite is named after. Uh, 
he sent him to Paris to oversee the cutting of a stone, which took over a year. And then it ended up being 128 carats with 82 facets. It was exhibited in 1893 in the Chicago's World Columbian Exposition and it has been pretty much a focal point of the jewelry world or one of the most famous gemstones in the jewelry world ever since then. Now, there's only four women who've ever worn this diamond in like a public setting. We don't know what's happened behind closed doors in Tiffany's, who knows? But do you know the four? I'm pretty sure I know the four. I definitely think you'll get three of them. Um, it was worn first by Audrey Hepburn and then it was worn at a socialite event. This is the tricky one. And I'll give you, it was before, it was before Audrey Hepburn. It it was in the fifties. It was worn in the fifties by, I remember seeing it's like at a, at a socialite ball or something by someone I Tiffany don't Featherball yes yeah I don't know what her name is and then Audrey Hepburn in the 60s and then um, Lady Gaga for the film A Star Is Born on the red carpet and then Beyonce for the latest Tiffany campaign perfect yep spot I'm on I'm following you yellow diamond I'm like a stalker of jewels and I think again that's why the jewellery is so important because the films will tell the story that they tell uh, but the jewellery will always remain and it was Mary Whitehouse who was the first socialite who I wore it I also thought that um, Marilyn Monroe might have worn it but I don't know hmm. I think she might have worn it for like a for an editorial but I'll double check that we can double check that but that might be like for publicly so out out maybe but anyway, she Marilyn Monroe did have a twenty-four carat canary yellow diamond that she wore. Not that, that she, she, wore. she didn't own any jewelry. Poor thing, she died yeah. jewelless. Yeah, and she is in a famous photo shoot with that, oh, but it's not the Tiffany diamond. Oh, okay. um, but I mean, twenty-four carat one, we'd probably uh, get away wearing that. Well, you did well, Matthew. And uh, well, this is not where the story ends with the Tiffany diamond. There, it's in one more film. Well, it's a replica of the Tiffany diamond. Is also in the film Death on the Nile. It's not. It's not the real one. Um, but like, there's also another like yellow diamond that's on um, How to Lose Guy in Ten Days. Yeah, Eleanor. Is that what it's called? No. Uh, Matthew's yeah. favorite movie. I really do like that movie, actually. I yeah. know you do. That's why I said it. And also, we can't. We're we're gonna finish, but like, obviously, my heart will go on. Yeah. Well, that's the. Uh, why did she drop the necklace in the ocean, Matthew? Why did she drop the necklace? Well. Why? There was an alternate ending as well, actually, that uh, she didn't. But again, look, that's. A blue diamond, like it's like the Hope diamond. This is Titanic, this by is the Titanic, way, everyone. Yeah. And if you haven't seen it, I've just ruined the movie for you. But um, the necklace <laughs> in that caused quite a stir and many replicas were then made of it and paraded around the world. But again, it just shows the importance of jewellery in a story because the story that's told in the Titanic, although it is a story of love and loss, it centers around a necklace. Thank you for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any favorite pieces from movies, we'd love to hear from you. Send in your stories and your favorites to experts at courtville.ie. Remember, we have notes on what we spoke about with links and anything else you might need in the description area of this podcast. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that follow button. We'd really appreciate it. My thanks to my trusty co-host, Elise Ketcher for today. Thank you very much, Elise. Thank you, Matthew. And to our podcast producer, dustpod.io. We'll be back with another magical and mysterious pursuit to the world of antique jewellery very soon. Until the next time, from me, Matthew Weldon, chat y'all very soon. (laughs) 